this down to exactly what you need. And anything else that anybody starts spouting to you, ignore it. Now, David, it's not going to apply to you because when you take your cardiac boards, this is merely the foundation. The, the, the stuff that they want to know is much, much more detailed. So the point of the general surgery boards is not lung cancer, OK? The general surgery boards on your written and on your orals are basically going to be the workup of a solitary pulmonary nodule. That is it. They don't want to know chemo. They don't want to know staging. They don't want to know anything like that on general surgery because that's not what you're going to do. The things have changed. I'm going to go over a little bit of both, and I'm going to go over the nodal stations because everybody throws this lingo around, and it's it's massively confusing and there's a real easy way to, to um, sort it out. Just remember for lung cancer there's non-small cell and there's small cell. I'm not going to talk about small cell. For your purposes small cell is a medical disease. Okay? There is a surgical option for it now but you don't need to know that. All right. For the non-small cell it's still broken down into adenos adenosquamous and large cell. Remember, there's no one pure cell type in, can in lung cancer. It's, there's always a spectrum. And, and when the pathologist reads it, you're going to get, well, I see some of this and I see some of that. The way they determine it now is with uh, molecular cell typing. Okay, But these are still the categories. And you do not have to know the um, EGFR and all of these other things. Uh, David, you will, but they'll go through all that. Um, for for y'all, you don't need to know that. As long as they say molecular typing, whatever they list is going to be right, and don't don't fret. The stages staging in lung cancer is the same as for any other cancer. So if you know the staging for colon cancer and you know the staging for breast cancer. You can translate it into this. It's based on size of tumor and lymph nodes. That's it. It's not magic. So if you can relate these things together, you don't have to independently memorize everything. And stage one is basically an isolated tumor under three centimeters. Stage two has some peripheral lymph node involvement, which is around the tumor. And then stage three will have more distant nodal involvement in the mediastinum. And like stage four, it's metastatic disease. Now, this is what makes everybody crazy. Um, and I can email this to you if you like. Um, you know, they're level one, level two, level four, level ten. What do I do? What does this mean? Yada, yada. Forget it. Just forget all that. You don't need to know all of that. The lymph nodes you need to know are 4, 7, and 10. Those are the only three numbers you have to remember. If it's anything of a number that is smaller than 4, it's not resectable because it's distant. It's out there. It's up the trachea. It's in the aorta. It's somewhere else. So smaller numbers mean bad disease. Larger numbers mean it's more closer to the tumor and then potential resectability. Make sense? So the only lymph nodes you have to remember are 4, 7, and 10. That's it. Rest of them, don't worry about it. If they say, well, you know, they got a 12 something or other somewhere, it's in the tumor. Or, you know, they've got station one. Well, it's up in the neck. Okay, so that, that's, that's how you have to relate all this. For the end staging, and again, this is the same thing. You see the smaller numbers up at the top. Four is still iffy, and what they're, what they're talking about basically is four is along the main stem bronchus, and that's going to be important for pneumonectomies. Seven is the subcarinal nodes, and that basically determines resectability versus non-resectability. If they're there, they're not resectable by definition. And then 10 is along the main stem bronchus on either side. 
Okay, and remember it's right or left. But again, 4, 7, and 10 are the only ones you need to remember. N0, like anywhere else, it's no nodes. N1 is ipsilateral hyalur or peribronchial, so it's along the bronchus and it's always on the same side. N2 means you're starting to get into the subcarinal region. And N3 means it's contralateral. And contralateral means non-resectability. It's across the midline. It's like lymphoma. Okay, across the midline, you don't deal with it. So the staging, that was a nodal staging. The tumor staging, and if you talk to the oncologist, it's a little different in their light, and we argue about this all the time. Stage one, isolated nodule, less than three centimeters, no nodes. Solitary pulmonary nodule, end of story. Stage two, greater than three centimeters, you can have nodes on the same side. Okay. Stage three, the tumor starts to get larger. It's three to four, actually. And you can have lymph nodes in the mediastinum or the tumor, regardless of size, is invading the chest wall. But you have to have proof of that. You can't go by an x-ray. Um, you can't go by a PET scan because lung cancers, and I'll show you with the PET scan, lung cancers have a nasty habit of creating a desmoplastic reaction around the tumor, and so it's really hard to tell whether they're invasive or not. You really can only tell once you get in there. And then, of course, stage four, you have distant metastases. So it's across the midline, it's on the other side, it's in the belly, it's in the brain, whatever. So if you had a solitary nodule less than three centimeters, but a brain mat, Stage four, okay? Stage four. Anything where there's tumor outside the lung in any capacity, so phrenic nerve involvement, hoarseness, malignant pleural effusions, stage four, regardless of the size of the lesion. And this is just the, the breakdown, and again, way, way, way too much information. You just need to remember T and N, and then I'll, I'll tell you when you resect, because that's the only time this is important. Okay. Stage 1A, or stage 1, you operate. Oncologists like to pre-treat. You don't need to pre-treat. You just operate. Okay. Lobectomy is still the treatment of choice depending on pulmonary function tests. Okay, we can fudge now a little bit with the staplers and that you can basically do a non-anatomic lobectomy. Um, but again, the, the treatment of choice, it, and if they're answering and if they're, if they're asking you about resection of a lung nodule and it turns out you have tissue and it's malignant, it's lobectomy. Don't answer wedge resection unless the pulmonary function tests are horrible. Um, <clears throat> and the reason being is that you have a 70% survival rate. Again, 1B, still lobectomy. Don't, don't worry about the A's and B's. They're not going to get that picky with you. Stage 1, lobectomy. End of story. 2 is still lobectomy. Okay, but remember stage two, you have nodes on the same side or they're peribronchial. There's a trend towards neoadjuvant therapy. Is it absolutely necessary at this stage of the game? There aren't any randomized trials saying you must do it. So if you forget that and somebody asks you that question, don't panic. You take it out. They'll come back and say, well, doctor, do you want to do anything else? And if the light bulb goes off, yeah, uh, yeah, I'd refer them. That's fine. You pass the question. Don't worry about it. Stage three, and this is where the breakdown is. And again, this isn't very clear. Um, and there's still a point of argument. 3A, you resect. 3B, the purists say you don't resect. Okay, so it's the three where, where it gets muddy. 3A, resect. 3B, don't resect. 
for your general surgery boards. For us, what they were doing now, and again, they haven't, that this trial was started and never finished. We're, we're doing, uh, for 3Bs, we're doing neoadjuvant, then restaging, and then seeing if they convert to a 3A. But you don't have to worry about that. And then four is, is a non-operative uh, issue. <clears throat> the contraindications to surgical resection are basically a 3B or a 4, and any other invasion into surrounding structures. So if they're invading the atrium, if they're invading the phrenic nerve, if you have SVC syndrome, if you have contralateral lymph nodes, by definition, you don't resect. Now, you will find somebody who will, but even for symptomatic problems like um, pericardial effusions or SVC syndrome, leave it alone. You're not going to help them. You're just going to buy yourself a lot of complications. You also don't resect if the patient is medically unfit, and that's why performance status is important. So you don't only look at it from the isolated tumor standpoint and nodal staging. You have to look at the entire patient and pulmonary function test. And medically unfit means basically poor cardiac or pulmonary status. If your post-operative, well, it fell. If your post-operative FEV1 is going to be less than 40%, if your DLCO is going to be less than 40%. So whenever you work these patients up, you want an FEV1 and you want a DLCO on all of them. Not just an FEV1, you have to know the diffusion capacity. And then if you have a marginal candidate where say they're hitting 45%, you're uncomfortable with them, you can do pulmonary exercise studies. And that will clarify um, some, of the, some of the confusion with your PFTs. Or the patient who doesn't understand a PFT and you can't get numbers on. I'm just putting up the chemotherapy drugs just so you, um, you have them. Um, basically, it's all cisplatinum based now, unless it's uh, EGFR targeted. Okay? So that's all you really have to remember. You know, cisplatinum with something else. And that, that's the way they string them. As long as cisplatinum is in the, in the, the list, you're good. That's a good answer, okay? The biologic state um, agents, just so you, if you see it, and I don't, they won't get it as for general surgery. Um, Avstatin is the newest one. It's an angiogenesis inhibitor. What they do is they add it to the chemotherapy, um, but it's contraindicated in squamous cell carcinoma. Basically, it's being used for adeno. The other one that's being used now um, extensively and probably going to supersede this is platinum is uh, Tarceva. The only reason it's not more extensively used right now is because it's very expensive. Um, this is an epidermal growth factor inhibitor. It's excellent for squamous cell. Um, and now it is being used as a second line therapy. So they'll start with cis platinum and then convert over. Um, and uh, it's given orally. So it's very easy to give. I, I see this superseding and probably becoming first-line therapy in the next five to eight years. So this is where the confusion arises, and this is what you have to know. You have a 60-year-old male without symptoms who presents for routine annual physical and a chest x-ray is performed. There's a nodule on the chest x-ray. What do you do next? What? Admissions, what is specifically do you want? You want the old x-rays. That's the answer. You don't proceed with any other test. Somebody comes in, you have an x-ray, you have a nodule other than history and physical, which is paramount. You have to get the old x-rays. This may have been there for 10 years, okay? Don't get trapped. This, that's the deal breaker on your oral exam. You don't answer that question in that manner, you're, you're done. 
and that's the solitary nodule. <clears throat> so this is your choice, okay? And basically you want to look at the prior chest x-rays. After you review the old x-rays, what do you want to do next? You're close. What did you see on the old x-ray? That's it. You want to know what you see on the old x-ray. So if it's been there for 10 years, what do you want to do? What are you going to tell them? Don't mumble. If it was going to kill you, it would have done it by now. Follow-up x-ray in a couple of months. You see them back in three months. You repeat it. Okay? If it's questionable, and it may have been there for 10 years, but you look at the old x-ray and you have the old films, and for please, please, please do not use old reports. Okay? You need to look at the films. <clears throat> and if it looks different, then what, are you, what would you do? Your yeah. Pet CT it. You can either say CT it with contrast, please. An uncontrasted scan is useless. Um, nowadays, it, I can, it's going to depend on the facility. You're better <laughs> off just doing a PET CT right off the bat. Then you'll know if it's hot, if it's cold, etc. Okay, so you'll have that information. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the PET shows a hot nodule. And here's the, the pet. Okay, you want tissue. In this day and age, you want tissue before you contemplate resection. Now, you can get it any number of ways. How can you do it? Yeah, you get IR to do it. They tell you, I can't hit that. Is it going to do you any good in this location? No. You do want to bronch everybody that you contemplate resecting. You want to see if there's other associated issues and if there's bronchial lesions that don't show up because sometimes they're hard to, to look to see on PET. So everybody that goes to surgery gets bronched. Now you can do it on the table before you, you open them. You can do it as a separate setting. Again, like your EGDs and like your colonoscopies, you want to do it yourself because pulmonologists have no clue as to tell you margins. They don't think that way. They don't look at it that way. You know, they can't tell you margin of resection. They can't tell you location. They don't tell you how far it is from the carina, et cetera. Okay? So, <laughs> but you'd like to get tissue before you go to the OR. If you're presented with the scenario that you can't get tissue before you go. Okay, fine. I'm going to go in, I'm going to wedge it out, and I'm going to send it for frozen section. Now you have tissue. Just don't make the mistake that, uh, hot nodule, I don't have tissue, I'm just going to blast in there and go do a lobectomy right off the bat. Okay. <coughs> so your, your answer of choice would be needle biopsy, but if you throw you a curve, if it's central, bronch may get tissue for you. If it's peripheral, more likely than not, and so therefore you should just go ahead and go on to wedge resection. <clears throat> so for the solitary pulmonary nodule, okay, about 25% of the people have symptoms, but most of them are asymptomatic. All right. Um, on the benign nodules, remember that PET scan has about a 7% false positive rate. So if it's hot on PET, you, more than likely it's going to be malignant, but remember, it's going to be history-based, sarcoid, fungal infections, et cetera, will present as, um, as hot nodules. 
Um, the other point you have to remember is if somebody is just coming off of an, uh, uh, an obstructive pneumonia, you don't want to work them up immediately. You need to give them about a month to resolve all the inflammation before you start proceeding with the workup unless something is seen obstructively on bronchoscopy. Um, <clears throat> so about 49% of them are of solitary pulmonary nodules are malignant. Um, and the older you get, obviously, the more likely it is. And again, based on history, smoking history, industrial exposure will increase the probability. On CT scan, and again, there's no absolute, generally what they look like is they're spiculated, they're irregular, they're, they have eccentric calcification. So calcification does not knock it out of being a, um, a malignant lesion, and they're usually greater than three centimeters. The other clue is they're, if they're squamous cell, they're cavitary. So if you see a hot nodule, hot rim with a necrotic center, it's squamous cell until proven otherwise. Generally, the benigns are nice and smooth and round. They look like marbles. Um, they're well circumscribed. If they have central calcium, so it's it's very very regular. I mean, you can it looks like a marble. That's the best way to describe it. And they usually tend to be very small. <clears throat> Okay, so when you're looking at the prior films, you want to know if it's new, you want to know if it's getting larger, you want to know if it's changing in shape, and if it's been there for over two years, more than likely it's benign. So what you do is you bring them back in three months, you repeat the x-ray, if it's unchanged, you just see them every year, or you contact their local doctor and you say, look, you just need to keep an eye on this, we're not going to do anything about it, okay? Um, if you're worried about it, if it looks a little irregular, there's no harm in getting a CT scan up front if they've never had one. Uh, just get it as a baseline. If they show up as negative, fine, that's, you know, you're out 800 bucks and that's the end of that. Um, you want to take it out if you have a positive tissue diagnosis or you want to offer resection if it's new, larger, or changing. There are certain benign lesions in the lung that will continue to grow, hamartomas, for example, and so they will get larger. They won't metastasize, but they will provide a problem for the patient in the future, and so if they're changing or increasing in size, you want to offer resection. Um, you do a CT-guided biopsy for tissue. Um, just remember that there is a pretty good sampling error depending on your institution, so you want to get to know your IR people and your pathologist very well. Um, again, there's a risk with waiting. Just cover it in your preoperative discussion, okay? Give them the choice. Just say, look, we're going to watch it. We have the option of taking it out or watching it. If we watch it, you've got X percent, which is about 15 percent chance that it'll grow. If we take it out, you're a low-risk candidate. And you can answer your oral board question that way. I'm going to give the patient the choice. This is my percentage if I take it out. This is my percentage if I don't take it out. End of story. That's it. They can't fault you one way or the other on that. Okay? Um, there's some futuristic stuff coming in which you don't need to know about. Um, if you're watching a solitary nodule, you initially for the first year want to look at them with repeat CTs about every three months and then after that you can go to yearly. After two years, if nothing changes, you don't have to see them anymore. <clears throat> this is the algorithm, okay, so if you present a patient comes in with a solitary pulmonary nodule, first thing you want is a history and physical. Exposure history, infection history, area of the country, travel history. What you have to sort out is infectious disease exposure nowadays. TB is rampant. You don't want to get caught in that scenario if you, don't, if you can help it. Um, then you want to get your old films. Old films are stable from what you have right now. You don't have to do anything else. Old films 
and what you have right now are questionable, they differ, then you proceed with a PET CT or CT and then a PET, either one. If it's a cold nodule, just repeat the CAT scan in three months. You're done. That's it. You don't have to do anything else. <coughs> um, if they're demanding that it be resected, that's fine. You can proceed. You know, just cover the risk of surgery. If it's a hot nodule, what you want to do is obtain tissue before you consider resection because there is a small percentage. It could be a small cell. Um, and either needle biopsy or bronchoscopy, depending on position and size. If you can't obtain preoperative tissue, then finish your preoperative workup and wedge it out in the operating room before you proceed with any further, um, further extensive resection. Um, before you go to the operating room, you must always assess nodal status and you always want PFTs. Now, nodal status can be assessed with PET. They don't, they're not going to want to know if you're going to do a Chamberlain or a mediastinoscopy. If you remember that, that's fine, but they, they're not going to know that. All they want to know is you're going to stage the nodes. You can stage the nodes with tet PET, you can stage the nodes with EBUS, or you can stage the nodes with an operative procedure. The easy way to remember the operative procedure, if it's on the right side, you're going to do a mediastinoscopy. If it's on the left side, you're going to do a mediastinotomy or Chamberlain. Just remember, left side aorta's in the way. You can't get in through here. You can't get there. Okay? And don't forget your PFTs. They're not going to get into differential perfusion scans. You know, they're not going to get into questionable uh, PF pulmonary functions and marginal patients for you. Um, and again, if it's stage 1, 2, or 3A, resect them. Now, if they, I didn't put the slides up, but if they present you with a carcinoid of the lung, they go through, it's a solitary pulmonary nodule, um, you bronch them, you'd say, okay, um, it, it's in a position and you choose bronchoscopy and they tell you that it is a red, smooth tumor that is obstructing the right upper lobe bronchus. Okay, first of all, pulmonary carcinoids are very, very distinctive. They, they look like a very smooth red piece of obstructing tissue. They don't speculate, they don't do anything. You do not want to biopsy it. I know they biopsy them all the time and they get into bleeding problems. These things bleed like crazy. Okay, so you do not want to biopsy. It is so characteristic that if you see it, you can propose resection. <coughs> okay? And you try to spare as much lung as possible. Remember, bronchial carcinoids do not give you bronchi uh, do not give you carcinoid syndrome. Okay, and they do not metastasize. There's only one type that metastasizes, and they're not going to tell you about it. And I think that's it. So you have time for coffee. Questions? Yeah. So, so you know the WashU at St. Louis, they are behind the SCORE program and the American Board of Surgery. And as you pointed out, they don't want, gone are the days of detail into lung cancer, but they will ask you the solitary pulmonary nodule and pre-op for workup of respiratory uh, from risk stratification in your oral boards. And the way you did it, they, they keep on going into details of it to a point that even there was an exchange where it was asked that uh, define sort pulmonary nodule and the candidate said less than three centimeter central functional tissue around no, not close to the hilum and mediastinum it was so detailed yeah Obviously the candidate was a thoracic guy so they laughed and they said okay good so so this is very important very very important and this and the respiratory workup for a chronic smoker preparing for a big surgery Remember, the people that are giving you your little boards are general surgeons, and more than likely they haven't seen one of these in 30 years. Okay, so 
you you have to you have to really drill it down to basics. And if if all you if all you do is memorize this chart, you'll pass. They're not going to get into the other stuff. They'll push you if you give them more detail. You want to keep it basic, you want to keep it simple, you want to keep it regimented. And the key points are old x-rays, tissue diagnosis, pulmonary function tests. That's it. Don't, don't get crazy about the nodal status, you know, don't, don't go there. They, they, you don't need to know that as a general surgeon. Okay? All right. Next week I'm going to cover cardiac tamponade, but it's going to be short, so I'm going to add Barrett's esophagus for you, since that's a real, real questionable area, and I'll give you the answer.